I'd like to welcome to the stage Shreeder Vembu, CEO of Zoho, and Brian Summer. Well, hello, everyone. I'm going to make this both educational and uh, entertaining. And I've brought a bag full of gag gifts that we're going to give out throughout this talk. And I don't applaud too much. They're not worth much, but they're gag gifts nonetheless. And uh, to help us out will be Sandy Lowe, and she's over there. And I'm going to ask you a question, and you've got to show your hands, which I know is a really hard thing for this bashful audience to do at this event. And then she's going to stand over there, and I might ask you a question before she gives you the gag gift. All right. Um, to kick off the entertainment part of it, and thanks for being here, Sridhar. Um, Thank you. I'll tell you my favorite software industry joke. And it goes like this. Imagine two columns. And on one column it says, can you see it? It doesn't really exist. If you can see it and it exists, then it's real. If you can't see it, but it exists, well, then it's transparent. Now, if you can see it, but it doesn't exist, well, then it's virtual. And, and you're going to hate me for this, if you can't see it and it doesn't really exist, well, then it's in the next release. Uh, so, with that, um, and for all of the attendees here from uh, Astonishing News to Mexico, yo me amo Brian Summer, um, uh, but we're going to do this in uh, English because uh, yo comprendo espanol muy poquito. Uh, well, let's get right to it. Goats. You raise goats. Why? <laughs> No, I, I mean, I have some pet goats. I should say I've had them on and off because some of them, I mean, I inherited a couple of goats from my previous owner of the property, a small ranch. So I raised them and then they really got old and died. And then they got a couple of more old goats and they lived with us for another three, four years. So that's, I mean, it's, their goats are very friendly animals. And when I'm going on walks, they accompany me sometimes. I want to get right to it. I wrote a piece back in late December that was called uh, something in effect of the SAS memo that many vendors, whatever, never read. And I know it caused a fair bit of consternation at a, at a few of your competitors because they seem to operate on a very different kind of business model than you guys do. And I want to get right to it. What do you think is the the right way to go at this. And in particular, I see a, a very bifurcated market where there are vendors who uh, my clients see like Amazon AWS with their like 62 to 65 consecutive price reductions. Good. And then there are all the application vendors that you compete with that have never, ever, ever seen a price go down. Only they go up. Right. So what is it? What is the right way that this should be yeah. happening right now? Really, I mean, if you look at the broader technology industry, I mean, forget software for a second, look at the, the phone in your pocket, look at the computer. All these things have become more and more affordable in the last you know, 20 years, 25 years. Fundamental technology drivers, fundamental productivity, and economies of scale, volumes, and global spread. I mean, cell phones are a billion unit market, so the prices keep coming down, actually. I just bought myself a, a $400 Android phone in India. That's incredibly good. I mean, I was shocked how good it is for $400. So I said, I'm going to make that my main phone now. And it's a dual SIM, so I can actually put both SIMs, US and India. Now this, you know, at $400 with all the features, that's something that I didn't even, I, you know, knowing the industry, didn't expect. But this something, somehow enterprise software, business software, this whole logic escapes the industry. As volumes grow, as productivity grows, as scale grows, prices have to come down. And this is something that, of course, AWS is now bringing this type of a logic to the enterprise market. But this has to happen in the application software, enterprise software market. And that's something that we are committed to doing. In fact, we are seeing, we look at as our volumes grow, prices have to keep coming down, software has to become more affordable to more businesses. Every, you know, our ZO one philosophy has been no software rationing. No one ever needs to ration software licenses. 
that's that's actually our philosophy yeah i need you to find me somebody in this audience who's been really ripped off by a vendor in the past and hopefully it wasn't zoho uh, <laughs> but can i get someone to show a show of hands because that person needs to be able to wear proudly the original techno gangsta hat uh, and or possibly even wear the original techno gangsta shirt and you need to wear it all throughout this show absolutely <laughs> so i have noticed that of vendors uh excuse me of buyers of technology they tell me the same three things everywhere i go i want to be out of the data center business i want to be out of the application ma maintenance business and i want to be out of the integration business mm -hmm. and i guess my question to you is do you hear the same thing as well yes which actually would sway we are mastering data centers. Of course, we are building all the applications, which is why we are doing all the integrations ourselves as much as possible. And we have built the integration technology to enable this on a very large scale. So because we hear the same thing, and it's very important for productivity, scale, and cost reduction over time. So all these are critical. How bad did you get ripped off by your old gangster vendor? Well, I didn't. I decided not to use their software because I couldn't import their data. And so they sent me a bill for 2000 something dollars after we, we, they had not performed any service and I had not used their software. There is another kind of style issue, and that is uh, with some of these vendors. We've talked about some of these original gangster deals. But I also think that there is another problem related to it, which has to do with something called fracking. But let, but let me give you the premise, folks. And uh, we're here in the oil patch in Texas. And in Texas, you have right near Austin, to the north of us, we have the Permian uh, oil fields. To the south, it's the Eagle Ford and the Austin Chalk. And if there's one thing they do well in all of them, they know how to frack. And uh, hydraulic fracturing is what happens when uh, an oil company pushes all kinds of high pressure water and sand to extract the most possible oil and gas out of a well. Software vendors do a lot of that now. They do this thing called wallet fracking. And uh, they keep putting every kind of bit of sales pressure, contract terms, everything else, because they're going to keep putting pressure on your bank account till they've got nothing but dollar bills floating up into theirs. So to that end, Sandy, I need somebody who's been fracked by a, uh, an old software vendor because they need to proudly wear this shirt which very clearly puts the sentiment right out there. It says, frack you. And uh, let's find someone who's been fracked out here. So the problem, you know, the, the, the issue with the fracking I found has gotten worse actually with the cloud error because we've got a lot of vendors who treat every renewal period as an opportunity to just put more pressure on a customer's wallet than ever before. So what kind of assurances is Zoho giving customers relative to the pricing and price movement over time? Yeah, I mean, we, if you look at our products, I mean, they've been customers with us five years, 10 years. We not only have actually not raised prices, we've lowered them often, and we also grandfather old customers into old pricing. That's actually been a historic thing for us because we want to thank them for being, having been with us for a long time, rather than we think of the old customers as someone to frack in this. We think we want to you know, display gratitude and say, you know, you stay in your old price. If you ever have to do it. I mean, we may do cost of living if there is ever, I mean, if the Fed is creating lots of money. So there may be inflation. We hope that productivity gains can allow us to still beat that. But if it doesn't, we still actually grant for the customers. So that's been our philosophy all along. And we have always been you know, extremely affordable. And we want to keep that same philosophy. And, and the way we can do this is fundamental productivity gains, okay. the way we do software. It's something that is interesting because I have analyzed a lot of the numbers in the industry. Software industry that helps the customers become efficient is itself is quite an inefficient industry. If you look at the numbers, because a lot of years of fat margins have made vendors actually really, really sloppy about their own internal processes, internal ways that they, they conduct their own, you know, whether it's R&D, whether it's sales and marketing, all of that. We actually think hard about all of this. I mean, this event, this is here in this center. We love this. I mean, we love all the 
surroundings, but it's also actually a lot more affordable than something right there downtown. So we keep it here because we choose to keep it here because we spend less and so we can charge you less. I mean, it's simple, right? That, that, so we think through all of these subtle factors. Raju spent, maybe visited 10 different event centers and picked one here. And he is optimizing, I mean, looking at everything, like what is costly here, what does it cost to do this? And that's the same attention to detail we pay in our software development, in terms of our sales process, in terms of all of marketing spend, all of these, and then we pass on the savings. So we, we actually draw inspiration from companies like Trader Joe's and IKEA, all of them, they, they do all this. I mean, they're very customer focused. They also offer great, great, great prices, and that's important. So, so Sandy, what's, uh, what's the name of your uh, frack victim back there? Hi, my name is uh, Dave Medinas, and I, after I heard the first ripoff answer, I thought, well, maybe I better share this one. Um, so at any rate, I had a customer last summer. They uh, wanted to change all their software. They spent uh, $300,000 uh, for their implementation. Of course, you know, they were promised the world. And after four months, they gave up. They, they, it just wouldn't work. And uh, when they asked the vendor, you know, well, what are they going to do about it? Uh, they just headed for the hills. So. $300,000, they got zilch. And, and that's, I mean, I, I know some war stories that are worse, like in the millions, but that, that was a personal experience. So, uh, I mean, the world is changing now, and I think uh, Stradar is doing a tremendous job to bring a new revolution and, you know, deploying software to the enterprise. So thank you, Stradar. Uh -huh. I, I get the feeling we could have a really cathartic, like, um, Jerry Springer show here with everybody talking about it, who done them wrong or something like that. It sounds like a good theme for a country western song. I, yeah. I wonder if there's a musician in the audience somewhere here in Austin. Um, well, let's, get, let's go to this area. You've talked a little bit about the university kind of idea, and uh, I know you guys have some strong feelings about not everybody needs to go to university. Um, I went to school just down the street here at a little place called the University of Texas, and I don't think they have 375 acres uh, for that campus over here. So we're going to be seeing something as big or bigger than UT sitting out here uh, out on the way to Bastrop. Hopefully someday. I mean, we are growing. We are steadily. We actually we the way we look at this. I mean, take the land purchase. Why we did that is that when we are. We want to make, we want to select a location where our employees can have a, an affordable quality of life. I mean, Austin is that location. I mean, it's definitely a far more affordable city than most cities. And when you bought land, part of it's with an eye towards maybe future housing, a lot of that we can create, and we have enough to spread that. So that's a lot of that thinking went into this. And we, as I said, we think long term. We only have. 75 people here, but we are going to add a few hundred people in the next five years. So we are thinking ahead of all this. And you look at Zoho University, it comes from that fundamental realization that credentials are not important to the work you do. I myself actually self-trained in software. I never really form, I mean, never studied computer science ever. I didn't take a single class on it because I, at the time, I didn't think I would like it, honestly. In fact, when I was in college, I avoided computer science completely. And somehow I found myself in this, and I, I decided I actually like it. So and I trained myself in software, all the technologies behind it, the computer science behind it, all of that is self-taught in this. And I know that a lot of our engineers, all of them come from that same flavor, that you go into a job, and then you learn, and you quickly learn. And today, the barriers have come down. Take any, anything at all, and there is any number of YouTube videos, blogs, and articles, material out there, and the determined person can actually learn. And when a company says you need these skills, there's even more motivation because there's a job attached to it. So that is why I think that the whole, I mean, the, the, the analogy I give is to the Reformation. If you go back to history, European history, in when the Reformation happened, that was a product of the printing press. 
and the fundamental thing there is i have a direct access to god direct relationship to god i don't need this intermediary the same way now the the, the thing the world, what is the world is going towards an era where i have direct access to knowledge direct access to truth i don't need this intermediary called the university and that's where we are heading so we are going to disintermediate the university in many cases and 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 employers have a really vital role to play and this is important because as i said the university has become a, a predatory corrupt institution in many cases the tuition is too high and they charge way too much and this has to be the only way to fight it is for companies like us to invest in this so that's why we are doing that what's yeah. good okay thank you so let's talk about something i know i usually get into it with every vendor and that has to do with the liquidity event and every vendor usually has some story about what they're going to tell us about but before i give you a chance to talk about it uh sandy we need to find somebody in the audience who needs one of these hundred dollar bill wallets and uh, i need to talk to somebody who has whose employer has maybe gone through a, a private equity ownership change or something like that. While you're tracking that down, I want to find out, you know, you guys have been really adamant about not doing these kind yeah. of things. In fact, there's like a laundry list of the things you're not going to do, and this is probably up at the top of the list, yeah. which definitely sets you apart from some of the other firms out there. But at some point, I would think you, you've got to wonder, like, I don't know, when you're 110, maybe you might entertain a liquidity event. But what's, what's got you so wound up about this stuff, I, about not doing these things? Well, let's go to first principles here. I mean, we are a business that makes a profit. We are able to invest in all of the things we want to invest in. We have no debt. We carry no debt at all. At that point, I mean, I get paid well. I mean, more than what I, my needs are. And we are able to treat, take care of our employees. Then what does the liquidity even do to us? And we choose a place like Austin so that our employees can live well on our paycheck and that we actually try to, you know, our productivity grows and we, we compensate our employees well and we retain them long term. So then you think about what does the liquidity even do? What it does is effectively transfer control to you know, Wall Street, third parties. And over time, as control gets diluted, dis distant, the context is lost, the purpose is lost. I mean, by definition, a financial investor cares about financial returns, not the psychic returns, not all of the things that we would care about. And they have to, I mean, it's, it's just, a, as I say, it's the nature of their business or as we call in India, the dharma of their business. They are, they are staying true to their dharma, their way of life. And that does interfere with the way we want to stay true to our dharma, that our way of life. And why create the conflict? I mean, having taken public or taken the money, then at that point, I don't want to fight about the purpose. What is our purpose? What should be their purpose? It's best to avoid that. It's conflict avoidance. So I am kind to them by not provoking a conflict, by not taking their money. So that's how I think about it. So I don't know if people in the audience actually understand that you're, you've funded basically a lot of the growth and development of this company through a prior company that was a managed engine. Well, that's still part of the group. I mean, Zoho Corp is still, you know, all these three things. There's a, there's a booth there, managed engine booth. Right and there. And buying 375 acres of prime Austin Hill country real estate, that's not going to require you to go dip into some venture cap or anything? No. Okay. no. We actually could. As I said, we built our data centers, all of these from our own means, because we actually, you know, we've been around in business 23 years. And if you go look at public vendors, they're profitable, but they've already pledged the profit to financial system financial investors while what we are doing is taking the profits and reinvesting in the business like this and investing in training investing in in uh, all these development all of these and new r d and this, this is a good way to live i mean i just like this way of life you can i mean sometimes they use a pejorative term it's a lifestyle business 
in a way it's true zoho is a lifestyle business we like this kind of lifestyle of being contented and staying true to our roots so that's the lifestyle we like <laughs> so so sandy uh, there we are so you've got someone who's been through some kind of like a private equity kind of change of ownership or material change control who are you sir and what did your company go through yeah i'm uh, pat conero and i'm with the product launch company back in 1999 when the uh, dot-com bubble was blowing up i had built up a company called microtool and we were in every semiconductor chip factory uh, teaching and calibrating robots, and we wrote a paper in Micro Magazine, and the, uh, the company got a lot of attention. We soon found ourselves in front of a, uh, a company being traded on the NASDAQ, and they made us an offer that we couldn't refuse. We thought it was a great thing for the company, and uh, we went through all of the, uh, the uh, due diligence to sell the company, and uh, 9-11 hit, and we had sold the company just a few weeks before 9-11, and Wall Street told this company in Boston that they needed to lay off 60% of their workforce. And I was the top dog, and they called me in, and they said, you need to come and pick out the people that you're gonna lay off. And I went in and I said, I can't do it, this is my family. And I said, you better take me, I'm the high paid guy. So they fired me, and um, I went off and, and started to do it again. But at the end, I just found out that last year, my employees bought the company back from the parent company. So it all ended wonderful, and it was a beautiful story. I'm actually glad to hear that had a no. positive ending on it. I was fearing Usually it's not a positive ending like that. I'm, I'm glad actually it happened that way. I mean, it's, it's fundamental. See, what happens is one, and this is actually very fundamental to the, the idea of interest itself, where if you, I mean, if you go back in history, every, you know, every civilization, every culture, we had this debt jubilee. I mean, every seven years or 10 years, the king or whoever, the, the, no, they will declare a debt jubilee because people get trapped in it. And so there is a recognition that this finance is inherently unstable, as it, the, the clock ticking, the clock is ticking and it becomes unstable. So we need to let people free of the debt. But we have built a society now where the debt dominates everything, all decision making. And I know and this, this, is, this gets loaded on top of companies and the employees then have to work harder and harder to just service the debt. See, a lot of this, today's economic problems come from this idea that that a lot of the profit gets pledged to repay debt and we have loaded companies with debt. So we have created a financial system that's intrinsically unfair now. And if companies get into this voluntarily, there's no real easy to come back. The culture cannot be preserved. That's something that I'm really firm on and we have actually experienced. I mean, we see this, as I said, often we, we actually, our, our best business opportunities often come from when private equity enters the space, picks up companies, because we know the customers are going to suffer. We know there's going to be opportunity for us there. It's, and it's happened repeatedly, repeatedly. Someday I am going to sit down with you and I'm going to hear a different story. I don't know when it's going to be. You're going to like have a new passion. You outgrew goats, I don't know, and you decided to open up a Tex-Mex restaurant here in Austin or whatever. But at some point- I actually met one of our customers here. He said he was in software and he's opening a bar in Austin. So, <laughs> maybe it could happen. Well, let's, let's continue this with going into the growth angle here. You know, at some point, your growth, you've had a really strong growth trajectory for quite some time, but there's got to be an absolute limit as to how far you can grow with the current capital reserves and the cash generation capability your company has. So, um, how much bigger can we expect to see Zoho get in the next, say, five years? Hey. And when, when does the growth ever taper off? I, you know, every company eventually stops growing at some level. I mean, you take the biggest companies in the world, the trees don't grow to the sky, as they say. But in our present model, we are not actually constrained by capital. We are constrained by, of course, ability to hire and retain people and, and, uh, and the need for keeping the culture 
So that's what actually constraints. We could go and hire maybe another 2,000 people, but we are doing it slowly because we want to do it the slow way. We want to do it where we keep our employees happy and we keep our customers happy because we just turn on the, the growth engine, as they say, and try to grow too fast. We are going to break stuff and we are going to often break people. So that is why we want to actually take it slower. It's not constrained by financial capital as much as all the human element of this. So, and, and we, since we are not in a rush to exit, we know the opportunity is out there. So we take our time. And at this point, actually, because of the compounding nature of this, we're growing faster and faster automatically because as more customers discover us, more customers come on board, the product suite is getting mature. So which means that more customers can be happy, you know, there's less stuff to break now because so many, I mean, so much of the software has been polished because of all the customers already telling us stuff and give us the feedback. I mean, it gets better over time. So that's where we are at. And, and our growth is not constrained by financial capital right now. So what you're really telling me is, reading between the lines, is you, you like having a very, very, very low cost of sales because you don't have to add a lot of expensive sales talent and everything else, which screws up your ability to scale and grow, which that also tells me you're going to stay very much a friend of the SMB marketplace more than anything else. Because if I start seeing you trying to take out SAP customers, I know you're in the wrong market and it's a very different We actually topic. are hiring salespeople now. We have hired, I mean, we have, a, in fact, a lot of the Austin growth is coming from our sales force expansion and we are creating small regional centers. But the key is there's a, even our sales groups have a different mindset than what you believe the typical enterprise sales model where, because the company's ethos is different and we actually don't pressure them to go close deals. There's not an end of the month pressure, end of the quarter pressure, all of that. There is much, much more of, uh, you know, this customer has to be right. We have to serve them right mindset here. And we believe that, in fact, larger customers are coming. Just now I had a meeting with a large customer who has maybe 1,000, 2,000 employees. So those customers are actually coming to us more and more. Okay. And it, in the next five years, I predict they're going to go into some 10, 20,000, 30,000 seat accounts because it is already happening in India. It is happening in other countries. It's coming to the U.S. So let's talk about some of the social stuff. We haven't... I haven't heard that much of that being discussed here at the show. Maybe it's because I didn't, I can't be everywhere at one time, but uh, I know you've got some pretty hot button, hot button passion areas around things like on the environment and on um, full employment and healthcare yeah. and the like. So I'll give you 30 seconds on each one of them. Tell me something, tell me the audience something they don't know about what you're doing in those areas. So we actually do some, uh, we have an organic farm in India that we bought some land and we have started some organic farming now. Part of it is, I actually, you know, food is really important. And the, and the more we decouple from our food sources, the less, I mean, in a way, human we are. Because we need to be aware of where our food is coming from. We need to be connected to all this. So actually, that's part of why we are experimenting with all this. Just, you know, just... Also, it gives some of our employees that passion. I mean, there's, there's people with the passion for organic farming. So those are the people who are doing it. Part time, actually, some of the organic farming is happening from our finance group. The people who handle our books, they're actually doing this. So that is one activity that is going on. And we are actually also have a civil engineering group. We actually have some passion for building the workplaces right. And I look at them as little, I mean, I come from a, an Indian village background. I always go back to my village in terms of my memory of how friendly the people are, how the, the whole ambience, the whole architecture, the micro architecture enable the human interaction. So, and that's something that we, we look at Zoho as a little village <laughs> that way, as a community. So we are bringing those micro architecture concepts into how the workplace ought to be. So we actually have a civil engineering crew that builds it, an architect who actually designs these. So we are experimenting with these forms. Because it's, you know, again, these are the things that, as I say, you get to live for these, doing these things. To me, the whole point of, 
earning money, financial capital is to be able to do these things. And so we are investing in a lot of these. So there is a civil engineering group, there is an <laughs> organic farm group. And here's the interesting part. I don't have any expertise in any of these areas. You, you do realize there's a large chunk of the business world who doesn't believe that the reason you make money is to actually spend it on doing good things, but okay. Uh. Well, but this keeps us vibrant and alive and creative. That's one. And the, and the part, this is the interesting part. I actually don't have any expertise in organic farming or in architecture or in civil engineering, any of these. But there are now very passionate people in the company that actually know these things. It's somehow, this, the company has become like a magnet to attract unusual talent like that. And then they go do unusual projects. So that's how, that's how we are growing, actually. And even the product growth has come from this. And I myself, uh, you know, the last thing I say, I myself moonlight as a, as a language, programming language developer. So I'm working on some interesting concepts there. That's actually my day job. This is my part-time job, <laughs> running the company. <laughs> so Sridhar, what is it that you're reading these days? Yeah, and, I and, actually, I, and I, I don't want to know the funny pages in the back of the Austin the American <laughs> Statesman, but uh, there's actually two books. They're later. There's one, the tyranny of metrics. This is about how you cannot measure. I mean, in in the the obsession with metrics is 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 taking us in the wrong direction in our education, in our healthcare, in the corporate world, all of this. It's funny thing for me to be saying this because we sell you software where we have a lot of data and we are giving you a lot of reports, analytics. But you have to look beyond just the software. I mean, no matter how good the software is, if you don't get the people part right, your business is not right. That's something as a software vendor, I'm, I'm humble enough to acknowledge it. Right? It's not our software, it is your people element that's most critical in your business. And, and for that, The Tyranny of Metrics is a book that is a welcome antidote. It's actually written by a professor. Uh, psychologist and uh, he says now how this obsession with metrics is leading us in bad directions in the corporate world in education in healthcare he actually has numerous case studies and examples of this so that's an excellent book and actually I think recently it got uh, one of the bestseller lists also I actually bought it before that but I was happy to see the book getting the recognition the other one is actually this is written by a professor in uh, Georgetown the case against education written by a college professor, Brian Kaplan, and I, the case against college education, I think that's what he means, because education is important, knowledge is important, but is a college degree important? That's a, that's a real thesis. The fundamental thesis is the college degree is really has primarily signaling value. That means that it, it gives you a signal that you are, you are able to get that degree. That's what it's signaling to the employer. It doesn't actually have an intrinsic value in terms of the knowledge gained because most people don't retain anything, actually. Most of us don't retain much from college other than that signaling value that we get. So he actually poses a very basic question. If, you know, would you rather care for an Ivy League education that you get all the, you get to take all the courses free or would you care for the degree they give you at the end? Which one is more valuable? And if you think about it, if you said, I want the degree, that already tells you which one is more valuable. The signaling of that education is more important. In fact, as a matter of fact, most universities, it's very easy to sit in on classes because they don't actually monitor who is in the class. That means if you are really, really, really wanted the education, you can sit in on a class by a Nobel laureate that easily because they don't actually monitor that. But the fact that they, they get to charge that pretty penny because that's for the degree, that the signaling. So he actually has a, erects a very good case against it. He thinks this obsession is leading us in the wrong direction as a society because uh, there is a credential inflation. There is, you know, every job now has way too many credential requirements. All of this is bad for society, bad for the economy, and bad for debt, all of these. So these are the two books, and you can see these are related. There's a metric obsession, there's a credential obsession. So he doesn't know I'm going to do this, but he's sitting up on the front row. Paul Greenberg over there, why don't you raise your hand? He just wrote a book. Yeah. And so did several other of my uh, peers, um, Dennis Pombrand, Vinny Merchandani, and others. But all their books are trash. The one you really want to read is this one uh, that I wrote, and you can put that on your bookshelf going forward. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Paul. <laughs> um, 
So let's go back to, uh, I, w- I want to touch a little bit more on the culture. And uh, I remember one time uh, a consulting firm asked, they asked me about their culture. And I said, you know, it's kind of like uh, the difference between um, uh, a packet of yogurt and your firm's culture is only one of them was actually a good culture. And uh, <laughs> They didn't like that answer, but it, it was really true. They had some problems. Now, you guys really, really work hard, I think, at creating a very kind of a consistent, even keel kind of culture. Now, I mostly see you guys in Pleasanton, and uh, maybe I get the all dressed up and super nice kind of version yeah. of Zoho, but. We um, can't do. Yeah. And, um, but I am curious how you guys. Uh, uh, give me a couple of words that, that would describe your culture. I know one of my clients, their culture was what they called constructive confrontation. And that was a tough place to go into. Uh, what, just give me a couple of words. Make it fit on a bumper sticker. What is your culture in a real short clip phrase? Actually, the, probably the most important virtue that I value is humility. Humility. Yeah, humility. And because, well, you know, it's... I don't because, think any industry analyst is ever going to work for you guys, but go <laughs> ahead. Uh. And the second one that says contentment. Okay. There's enough because, you know, we, a lot of, I mean, these are not particularly relevant to just the business context, but the whole life context, because people with these traits tend to actually, you know, be happier in, in, at work, happier with, in their relationships, happier with customers. So, and these are, and, and you're able to sustain your efforts long term with these. So that's what we uh, uh, describe ourselves. And we want to live, stay true to that, that humility and contentment. So let's go to one more topic real quick, and then we'll br- start bringing this to a close. So I want to get a couple of words from you about the future. But before I do, Sandy, find me one person in here who legitimately bought Bitcoin. Because I have... I have here a Bitcoin coin, and um, somebody gets it if they've got a good Bitcoin story uh, that they're willing to share with the crowd here, but you had to have traded in Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency. So, uh, Sridhar, you know, we, we hear, we've heard like Raju and others, and they've talked about some stuff going forward, but I really haven't, you know, there's a bunch of advanced technologies I haven't heard about. Uh, you guys, I know you've got a lot into chatbot technology and, and related like yeah. AI machine learning goes with it, but I haven't really heard anything about the blockchain and the cryptocurrencies. I haven't heard anything really about you know, Internet of Things, um, hardly at all. Uh, give me an idea of what's really out there. I mean, you're not publicly traded, so there's no FD disclosure issue here. Give me something that makes everybody in the audience look like the old TDK or Maxell tape ad. They're all, I want them all sitting back going, wow. Give them that super duper visionary uh, concept here. So what, what is it that you guys are working on that's a blow your mind away kind of idea on the future? I actually, I am working on... And it better not be double entry accounting. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> it's actually even more boring than that. It's a programming language. All right, come on. What so, is? It? Give me some. Give us. I know, us a taste. I know, I know. You're getting bored. I'm, I'm a boring person. I told you. But seriously, actually, I, I, I look at the software landscape. I look at all of these. Really, a lot of progress is coming from the way we express code, and that, you, I mean the key to quality and productivity and security. A lot of this is there. So that's actually what I'm personally passionate about. There's substantial gains in security, productivity, because you know, every day you hear something about hacking. And there's some fundamental reason for it, because the fundamentally, the technology foundation today, it's impossible to absolutely secure. There's some fundamental problems there. And I mean, it's, it's not because people are dumb. It's because it's intrinsically a very, very hard technological and mathematical problem. And there is a, there's, I believe there are ways to innovate around this using some fundamental ideas. So that's one thing that security uh, as a very fundamental uh, feature of software we develop. It has to be done at the very foundational level, at, a, at the way we express code, which is at the language level. So that's one uh, thing that. 
and uh, you, you talked about Bitcoin. We actually are working on blockchain for our Zoho sign kind of product. That's something that is contracts, smart contracts kind of thing with the Zoho sign, the digital signature that we are working on blockchain. So that's coming in. I myself don't have a lot of faith in the currency blockchain, this thing. The, the, and, and, and the reason for that is I actually believe that currencies today, particularly fiat currencies, need a state level backing. And without, I mean, essentially a currency is only about as valuable as the military that backs it, in a way. Because you ought to be able to collect taxes in the currency. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, there's no currency, there's no trade. So that means that that's actually the US dollars, a lot of the value is also coming from the fact that the US is a military superpower. Absolutely. And so it is important, I think that that's, uh, I don't think that's going to change because people need that, you know, somebody to back up that currency and that is, that has to be, ultimately it is a military power, you know. And all the world's currencies are that way today. So I believe that that's where I, I don't actually have a strong faith in the, the, the cyber currency itself as non-state actors in a way. I mean, there's a little bit of that whole, you see the, uh, what is that, the, the new MMT, the modern monetary theory you might have read about. There is a truth to it in the sense that you are, I mean, the, the, the state issues the currency and the state is collecting taxes. But what I don't believe is that the state can do it indiscriminately. So you need a sound currency. So you need a political system that guarantees a sound currency. And it is an act of political will. It is not some automatic process. So we have to exercise our our democratic right to ensure a sound currency, a stable currency. So there's no escaping that. And I don't think that automatic technology is going to fix that problem. In other words, I think that there is a techno utopians who believe that it's a technology problem. I believe it's more of a political and a democratic will problem. People who want a stable currency, a sound currency, will get it. People who don't want it, I mean, you have Venezuela now. So. Yeah, I'd uh, say that many of the challenges we face going forward with technology, we've done all the, we've done a lot of process automation of old processes, and now we're into some really new rarefied space that the people and change issues are going to have the big significant uh, constraints on how far and how fast we can go. So, Sandy, where did you go? Oh, right over here. Oh, we have a Bitcoin person now. They need to be able to tell us truthfully, did you make or lose money on Bitcoin? Oh, I would say this coin is probably worth more than my Bitcoin wallet. So. Ah. <laughs> well, I, want you, I don't want you to spend it all at the bar here tonight, but right. anyway, go ahead. Okay, okay. So, so tell us real quick, what, did, what happened in your cryptocurrency adventure? So my cryptocurrency adventure started with a developer who knew how to crack the code of sorts and play the game and, and acquire Bitcoins. And he was like, oh, you should try it. But we were more interested in the uh, blockchain technology, actually, as well. And what we would talk about is the transfer of smart contracts and data and how that in the future will relate to the gig economy and passing work back and forth and then the ability to exchange currency as well in the way that you want to do it. So anyway, he said, uh, you might just try it, get yourself a wallet and get some Bitcoin. So I put 50 bucks into it to see what would happen. And this was right before it, no, not right before, it was in the middle of its rise up to $17,000, I think it was. Um, so after I got that, I, you know, like a good friend does, reached out to one of my friends and said, hey, <laughs> I just bought some Bitcoin, you should go do it too. And he put 10 grand into it and then it went. <laughs> so that's my Bitcoin story. <laughs> Well, I was hoping for a more positive story uh, to wrap this up with. But uh, Anyway, I, beggars can't be choosers sometimes. Well, let's do this, folks. I want to say a big thank you all for coming here. I really thank you for sticking around right here to the bitter end. Uh, it's been a long day, I know for sure. Thank you, Sridhar. Thank and, you. Uh, thank thanks, you, everybody, for being a great audience. Yeah. Appreciate it.